Hello, this is Sam Gerrans from samgerrans.com. Today is Friday, August the 18th, 2023. And normally what I do on this channel, at least a couple of times a week, is go through propaganda and break it up and look at it and explain why they're spinning up your mind and all the rest of it. But I thought today, you know what, I'm going to break things up because I know I'm bored with all of that. So I thought I'd entertain myself if, uh, if nothing else. So... Uh, as people who watch this channel know, I live in Russia. I happen to have a degree in Russian language and literature. I've spent about 23 out of the last 30 years here. Um, I get accused of being a sort of pro, pro-Russia pro uh, sort of apologist or pro-Putin. And then other people say I'm, I'm against it or whatever. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if, if those sorts of um, labels really apply. But one thing is for sure, I, I have spent a lot of time here. So what I thought I'd do is break things up and... Uh, give you my alternative 10 best things about Russia. These aren't going to be the normal things that people say are good about Russia, you know, especially now, uh, although they are true. Like, you know, you're not, uh, it's, it's pretty safe and, uh, you know, no, um, what Americans call trash on the streets, nobody dying of fentanyl all over the place, all those sorts of things. The fact that a lot of the buildings have been improved and the infrastructure and all of that. I'm not, none of that stuff, okay? It's none of the stuff that you get after, you know, you, you can pretty much see when you come here on, on holiday. I'm going to give you the stuff that you, you pick up over a, a life spent here. And so they, here they are. I'll make them quick. Yes, this is like a, a, what YouTube is supposed to be, you know, 10 top things. Here you are. I'm supposed to count them off and it's supposed to kind of, take eight minutes 17 seconds or whatever but i don't know if i can manage that but i'll just give you my top 10 things of of living here in russia number one uh driving yes i know you might be a bit surprised to hear that given russians um uh reputation in driving some of which i have to say to be honest is a little bit unfair because quite a lot of what you'll see on youtube from russian driving is a bit out of date like pretty much everything in this country things are changing they're changing very fast i used to say about russia if you want to travel the world just go to russia and don't leave because and what i meant by that was it just changed around you uh, this is part of what the, the the problem the west has with russia is the russia is talking about now uh the, you know, they're talking about a russia of the 1980s or even 90s or even early 2000s and honestly that country doesn't exist but there are still some some characteristics which have stayed true so the driving is interesting let's put it that but there is a great thing about the driving here which is when you do something when you do something really stupid you know it happens we all, we all do occasionally nobody notices i mean they literally don't notice so that's number one number two fatalism fatalism here is a mixed bag uh it takes some getting used to it's somewhat uh oriental you see russians Russia is, is a, it seems, it's either a synthesis or it's a, a conflict, a kind of um, amalgamation of East and West. It, it, is, it is both. And whilst you do have, you know, the, a lot of the Western ideas here, you also have a fatalism which, is, which is, takes some getting used to. Uh, it's changing a little bit. Um, in, in Russian, it's kind of called sudzba. Sudzba. So I'll give you an example. Sudzba is, um, let's say, I, I'm, I'm, I'm Russian and I have lots of money and I want to go on holiday and I want to go skiing. Let's say that I buy the best tickets I can get to the best resort, wherever it is. And the, I buy the best, the best skiing gear that I can possibly get and invite all my friends and they all come with me. So we've got 20 Russians on holiday or about sort of embark upon a, uh, a skiing holiday in somewhere probably very expensive or as expensive as it's possible to get. Now, there's a little problem with all of this, which is that you've never learned to ski. But that isn't a problem here. That is just a matter of what's called sudzba. Uh, fate basically so if you go into it with a you know with the right attitude and a kind of a sort of manly approach to it all you you will naturally be able to ski it's something that will just accrue to you because of your attitude in it and if you do happen to fall down the mountain and break your leg and end up in traction in, in a hospital somewhere that is it's not because you were irresponsible <laughs> went into it without any idea of what you're doing no this is fate you see now 
I, when I first came here, I used to think that this was ridiculous. Um, I still do kind of think it's a bit ridiculous. But having spent quite a lot of time here, I've learned the wisdom of this. There is a kind of a sophistic wisdom behind this. And the reason that there is, is because Russians, certainly more traditional Russians, it's being sort of uh, sort of edged out of, out of the, the cultural narrative, but can do sometimes amazing things because they, don't, they simply don't comprehend or uh, appear to countenance any possibility of failure. And so they built helicopters and you know things that are just completely completely bizarre mm. and sometimes the impossible requires this this sort of attitude it's it's perhaps it's the difference between uh he wasn't actually russian but gordiaev who was uh, greek armenian on the one hand and uspensky on the other although uspensky was russian so he's kind of i suppose going against the the, th the thrust of my narrative but this kind of Gordiaevan approach where you just basically wrestle life you know you uh, thinking of of life as a sort of um a, a a bear in the woods you just go up and jump on this thing and start punching its head in and sometimes you know it collapses sometimes it turns around and eat turns around and eats you but quite a lot of the time it just sort of collapses on the floor and there you are you've defeated you know the bear this attitude is was new to me and where it works, it can work fantastically. Number three, ennui. Ennui is the English or French version of the Russian taska. Taska is a uh, is not a bug; it's a feature um, of, of life. Now, in in the West, we have boredom or frustration. It's not really either of these things. It's something else. It, it's almost like the the smell that a wok acquires if you don't wash it but you cook a lot it, it it's almost kind of infuses with its own characteristics um one's inability to to kind of find a positive productive sort of faustian outcome to things it can seem like it's self-serving and a feat and effeminate on occasion um and it, it can be that um but once you get it once you get this you can read for example I don't know, Ablomov, and, and get why he's incredibly funny and philosophical. Or you can read a 200-page novel, or at least the first 200 pages of a novel in which nothing happens, and then somebody kills himself for no apparent reason. If you've got a kind of like a handle on this Tusca business, um, it, makes, it, turns, it turns being bored from a sort of passive occupation into almost like a philosophical... Um, career aspiration all right next maximalism this is number four maximalism maximalism is sort of taking things to their i would say even illogical conclusion and there is a certain um there is a certain um kind of i don't know it kind of can, can, can catch you up in its in, in its in, in its net of um exuberance but you, you have to kind of get in, you can't just read about it, you have to experience it. I'm not quite, um, okay, but I can give you one example, and this was, and I, this is what Putin said, and again, this is not me you know, waxing lyrical about Putin, it's just, you've all heard of Putin, right? So this is why I'm using this as an example. Talking about all-out nuclear holocaust, which is the kind of maximalist, you, you don't get more maximalist than this, Um Putin, who, if, if, you, if you don't know, Russia has a policy of no first strike, but, but there's, no, there's no sort of tit for tat with Russia. If you hit Russia with nuclear weapons, we're going to use everything and destroy everybody. Okay? Uh, what Putin said is, we're all going to die, but we will die as martyrs. And I, I, I agree with him, actually, and, but I'm using this as an example of the type of maximalism of which Russian culture is is capable okay you wouldn't get this in england uh, the british wouldn't do this the british would pretend to be your friend and shake your hand and talk about you know cozy lovely gushy feelings and then stab you in the back and you know steal all your stuff um this kind of russian approach is something that i personally have a, a more of a sympathy with uh, but maybe that's why i came here uh number five a totally new concept of force majeure now, force majeure, if, if, if in the West, um, it basically means an act of God. So, uh, let's say, for example, your house gets hit by 
a bus that falls out of a out of the back of a Hercules transporter as it flies across the sky. It comes untied, falls three miles to the ground, and smashes through your house. This would be would be regarded as an act of God. Okay, we have this concept, and we kind of know what it means. In Russia, force majeure is completely different. Force majeure is mm, didn't really feel like it. Uh, the alarm clock didn't go off, got stuck in traffic, uh, couldn't be bothered. Force majeure. You see, just it's the same general ballpark, but it's in a very different part of that ballpark. Uh, okay, related to this is number six, elastic religious conceptions. Now, I come from England, so we have uh, culturally, uh, although not by conviction, but culturally I am uh, uh, the Church of England. Now, the Church of England is a sort of combination of um, of, of Catholic and Protestant. It's got elements of both and sort of it is actually something else. Here we have, uh, well, obviously we have the um, the Russian the Russian Church, but, but a kind of more fundamental religious concept here is is summarized by an expression which is, "Если нельзя, но очень сильно хочется, то можно." And what that translates as is, if you're not allowed to do it, but you really want to, then you can. And this is just very Russian, and it appears to be a sort of infantile, childlike um, irresponsibility. And 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 it it would be if only one person was doing it. You see, and you you were surrounded by responsible grown-ups being everybody else. But that's not the case. Everybody does this, and when everybody does it, it completely changes the the, the, the dynamic. And it requires that you look at things a, a completely different way. It's almost esoteric. Anyway, next one, number seven. Best sense of humor in the world, in in my opinion. Uh, and as Russians themselves will tell you, you're going to need one. Uh, it's it's it, the sense of humor here isn't just like a way to let off steam. It's 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 the only responsible um, reaction to living in a, in the kind of world that I've already described to you. Uh, I mean, in England, we have a you know the English sense of humour is is you know noted across the world. Uh, Russians, in describing things, they have an understanding of English uh, humour. hadn't thought of that, but it's true. It's called tonki angliski humour. It means subtle English humour. Um, what it means is is it's not funny. Okay, but the, the, there is obviously fantastic English humour, but Russian humour tends to be. Uh, well, it's, obviously, it's, it's a broad church, as is English humour. But a lot of Russian humour is the ability, in fact, almost the re requirement to laugh at oneself. And, I mean, there have been comedy, com com comics here, like just one, for example, Zadornov. That's basically all he ever did, was take the rise out of, about, out of Russians as a, as, as a kind of, as a, as a civilizational entity. Um, I quite like Zadornov. I went to see him and I, I enjoyed it. But... Uh, it's not the only type, just like, you know, Benny Hill, for example, or Mr. Bean, who are the, the two most famous types of English humour across the world because they didn't require any words. So they basically were pumped out all over the world in, you know, in, in, in countries which don't speak English. That, that's a very, very small and minor part of English humour. Um, Russian, likewise, is, is a very broad church and... and multicoloured and worth the effort, I would say. So that's another thing. Where was that? That was uh, number seven. I've claimed here that it's the best humour in the world. It's, it, I enjoy it, I have to say, and it makes living here possible. And uh, it's, it's, if, you couldn't, if you couldn't laugh here, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be bearable. But I would say that it almost fits in with all the other things that I've been talking about. It's almost like the, the cement that holds the rest of it together. Um, number eight of my alternative 10 best things about Russia. Um, pathological philosophizing. A philosophy here, it is changing a bit, it's, but certainly when I first came here, it's still, it's still there. I think in in at least in embryo, uh, it's not like this is a pastime that only a few people do. It's um, something that everybody does, and a, a bit like New York taxi drivers, 
uh, at least you know, 30, 40 years ago, were, were, were known for this, or London taxi drivers. Everybody here has got a philosophy. And when you become friendly with somebody, becoming friends is completely different here to how it is in, in the West. In, in, in the West, we are more friendly uh, superficially, more friendly apparently, uh, at least nicer to use this term. Um, and it's very, it can be very difficult to go anywhere with this. It's just like this floral dance. With Russians, we're kind of different. We're pretty brutal because we just assume everyone else is a moron and they're just just, just an irritation, uh, you know, to wit the things I've just listed above. Until you become closer and you, you cross over this threshold and enter into, uh, into a different sort of... Um, dynamic like it, it, I just as an example in the west we in England we use the word friend we bandy this word around he's my friend and we're friends mm, probably not probably not from a Russian point of view yeah, we have different gradations of acquaintance so I might have for example on priatil he's you know he's he on znakomi on priatil on priatil znakomi znakomi means he's somebody I know I, we're on sort of a nodding acquaintance. Priatil, it's closer than that. It's closer than that. Um, but, but most people in England would have said, he's my friend. They use this word in a very uh, indiscriminate way. And then you've got the next gradation, which is Priatil. Priatil is like a, a, closer, a closer acquaintance. You may know more things about each other. You're closer, but it's not friend different. Then you've got Druk. On, on my Haroshi Druk. My Druzia. We're friends. He's my friend. We're close friends. We're good friends. This is a different conception and different rules come into play here. And it's not just and it, where you, you probably in English we use the word friend in this, as I say, very indiscriminate sort of way. Maybe in English we would say close friend. This is, this is what Druk means. And it's there are it, there are certain res rights and responsibilities which accrue to it. The, you help each other. You you have to be there for each other. And in this in this environment, which is a very harsh environment, um, it's very harsh in terms of climate. It's harsh in terms of people. It's harsh in terms of government. It's harsh in terms of you know everything. When you more like but closer in some ways to how it might be in in the Arab world where. You know, we see Arabs, we think they're all Arabs, but Arabs don't quite see things that way. They see things in terms of tribes. You know, I belong to this tribe, and we hate that tribe, or whatever it is. It's more, it's more tribal in that way. And so I, uh, it's a far better way of surviving, and it's something which the globalists want to get rid of as well. They want to stop that, because that stands in, in between, you know, the, the human being as, as, as an atom and the almighty state. So that's something that I like. Uh, nine. Yes. <laughs> A kind of dichotomy, which is that Russian, the Russian mind seeks to um, systematize pretty much everything. But when it's done that, it then looks for an exception, uh, usually for themselves individually the things that i'm listing here they actually kind of they all fit together if you can fit the things that i've just listed together you've got a really good insight into russia how russia really works so if you look at you know mendeleev or whoever it is russians have produced chess players mathematicians you know, chemists all these sorts of people and also i i suspect i'm not i mean i'm not a i'm not a lawyer but i suspect that the actual russian system of law has got something to do with this so Russians are very, very officious. Uh, they, they can be. But in parallel, almost in contradiction, but in parallel to this, they're ex open to a complete negation of all of that and just um, forget, a, forget the, all the rules just, whoosh, just go out of the window. And I'm all right with that. I've, I've learnt, I've, 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 absorb that as part of my personality. When I first came here, I was, maybe when I first came, first, first, first came for a couple of months, I was about 26, 20, 20, 24. And then I came, when I came to live, I was, for the first time, I was about 26, 27. So I was just young enough to be 
and also because the time that I came was so, it was the 90s when I was first here. And I, you know, I, I mentioned this to Russians and they said, you were here in the 90s? I said, yeah. And it's suddenly, it's like you've got this bond because you, it was it was a very tough time. And I think the, the, the combination of the language and being here at that time and being in, in a country that was not only very different in and of itself, but in complete turmoil at that time kind of remade me gave me the, the chance to kind of go back and look at a lot of assumptions that had come come f f uh, f with from from europe and in a way it kind of it was almost like a like a sufi experience of of breaking down all of those breaking through the veil i'm, I'm i didn't want this to sound hippie but 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 this is correct and in a, but i never lost what i came with so i have these two gave me the opportunity to see things from very different perspectives. Um, it's not that I think that everything is just, you know, relative and you can just choose this and choose that. No, but, but when you can look at things from, you know, from the micro and the macro and, and then invert it, it gives you a sort of an independence that's, that can be achieved by other means, but this is how I achieved, one of the ways in which I achieved it. And anyway, uh, yes, and as, as regards this, um, the like the creation of laws and then this exception this kind of exceptionalism which is implicit in the creation of these laws you have something which i've noticed in russia and which is again sort of woven into the waft and web of life here which is uh and what that means is there, there is no fence without a hole in it and this is almost esoteric that when you approach life in this way, it is. Um, there's always a way around things. Now, obviously, you can take this and say, "Ah, oh, you see corruption. Ah, oh, you see this. Ah, oh, you see that." If you want, if, if if that's the level of your thinking, then okay, fine. And I'm not saying corruption doesn't exist here. It exists in every country. What I am saying is that there is a kind of a uh, a mindset of um, good humoured optimism that that is part of things here something that i like and have benefited from and lastly number 10 language now it takes a while to learn russian and to feel the nuances of it etc um but i'd say it's it's worth it i'm i never regret the fact that i learned russian it stood me in very good stead but uh, i'm not going to hit bore you with you know the, the the, the minutiae of the Russian language. I do want to say this though. In the Russian language, Danit Navirna makes sense. Okay? And I'll just translate literally each of those three words. Da literally means yes. Niet literally means no. And Navirna literally means probably. So literally it means yes, no, probably. But it actually means something. And when you can feel what it means, I think you've pretty much cracked the whole of what I've just been talking about, and it all makes sense. Anyway, I thought that might be a, a welcome break from looking at propaganda and all the rest of it. I'm going to leave it there. Details of where I upload to, how you can join my Substack and Telegram channel, support my work, and download my books free are in the description. Thanks for listening, and bye for now.